I'm Mike Balfour. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Amazon. And the talk today is about our journey in optimizing terrain. Uh, and it's more generally a talk about the journey to optimizing in general. And so over the next 30 minutes, I'm going to take you through the story of what we went through, uh, where we started, uh, the approaches that we took to optimizing the terrain system, and then finally, how far did we get? I had to write the title to this presentation several months ago. No idea what was going to happen, so it was pretty exciting. Uh, so uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, I've been at Amazon for a little over six years working on Lumberyard and O3DE. Uh, but before that, I've been in the games industry for over 23 years now, uh, back to the PlayStation 1 era. And so I've had to optimize a ton of different systems on a ton of different games to get them to ship over the years. And one of the things that I've seen over time is just how much the patterns of optimization really have been the same from system to system, even if the specifics change. And that's why I really wanted to be up here talking about optimization today. And so going back a year ago uh, to last year's O3DCon, uh, we were showing very, very early versions of the train system. That was right as we were starting to work on it. Uh, and so uh, our, the goals that we've had for the train system from the start, we have a bunch, but there's two that are really kind of pertinent uh, to this, this problem today. And so the first is we have always wanted the terrain system to be dynamic. Uh, we wanted it to be modifiable right from the start in runtime as much as it could be modified in the engine and for that to be performant and interactive. Uh, the other thing that we've wanted is we set a goal of supporting uh, terrain sizes of at least 16 by 16 kilometers at half meter resolution. And this is about a billion unique data points that we're trying to support. Uh, and why 16 kilometers? Uh, it's kind of a magic number in game development uh, because we tend to store positions, velocities, accelerations, and things uh, in 32-bit floating point numbers. And uh, these numbers start to degrade in precision. And it just turns out 16 kilometers is kind of this magic place where for game systems, everything really starts to break down in a hurry. Uh, and so most games just won't cross that boundary, even most open world games from Horizon Zero Dawn to Zelda Breath of the Wild all fit pretty comfortably in 16 by 16 kilometers. So that felt like a pretty good target for us to aim for. And just to put it in real world terms, uh, this is a chunk of Utah Rocky Lands with a little town in the corner there. Uh, that's 16 by 16 kilometers. What do you mean by unique data points? So what data, what is the data? Uh, so the, the data, uh, the question is, uh, what do I mean by unique data points? So a terrain consists of heights, it consists of surfaces, and uh, that data is described at different points, and the half meter resolution is describing how many of these points we're describing it at. And so uh, across all of that, it's a billion heights, it's a billion surface weights, uh, and a billion points of color. Uh, and so that's, uh, that, that's the scale we're talking about here. Um, in urban terms, 16 kilometers gets us from the Statue of Liberty out there in the harbor in the distance, uh, all the way to the other side of Central Park. So 16 kilometers, Felt like a pretty good goal. Uh, the problem is, at the end of last year, uh, in O3D's first major release, where we were at, uh, we had terrain as a proof of workflow. So you could author terrain uh, and build it and run it, but it definitely wasn't ready for production. And the easy metric we have for this is how many seconds did it take to get into game mode? Uh, for a one square kilometer, uh, it took eight seconds to get into game mode. Uh, it scaled exponentially, so at four by four kilometers, it was taking almost two minutes. Uh, and the system was actually limited uh, to four by four kilometers at the time. Uh, but if we extrapolate it out 
Uh, it would take 8,400 seconds uh, at the, the goal that we were trying to achieve, which is over two hours. Uh, our goal is two seconds, <laughs> and so that's where we get this number. We need to optimize this by 4,000 times to hit our goal. Uh, so easy, right? <laughs> so time to optimize. Uh, and like I said, optimizing any system, uh, for me, it tends to come down to these approaches in pretty much this order uh, for almost any system for performance optimizations. And so it's measuring what we're doing, reducing it, and then finally going asynchronous and parallel. So before doing anything, it's super important to measure what you're doing. You really need to know uh, where you're starting from and with each optimization that you do, is it taking you in the right direction and by how much? And so for us, because our goals were these terrains of up to 16 kilometers, what we did was we could measure holistic performance really easily by just building out levels that are one by one kilometer, two by two, four by four, and then as we were able to expand the system to take on larger sizes, eventually eight by eight and 16 by 16 kilometer levels. And these levels were all built with the same data, and so they each had a macro color texture and a normal map, they had a height map, they had three different surface types, they had physics enabled, and to be able to test this, it was very repeatable and measurable. Uh, we could just go into Pix, start a capture session, come back over to the editor, uh, hit play to go into game mode, uh, hit escape to come back out of game mode, hop back over to Pix, and that was it. And so we could keep taking measurements like this, and those two spikes that you see uh, in the center there, those are the very obvious things that we needed to work on fixing. Uh, the other type of repeatable scenario that we had, because the terrain system has a public API and terrains are generally built around querying, uh, we could also do API-based scenarios using Google Benchmark. And so we were able to take each of our terrain APIs and the APIs that we relied on in gradients and shapes and build out a series of synthetic benchmark calls to these APIs where we test them with a million data points or 16 million data points, and we could measure how long they take to process each one. And then we captured this in spreadsheets over time, and we could see how those were tracking. And so by measuring things at a very granular API level and holistically uh, by measuring the levels themselves, it gave us a really clear picture of what we were optimizing as we were going through this. So once we know where we're at and how to measure it, it's time to make things faster. Uh, for making things faster, there's kind of a spectrum of approaches that you can use. Uh, on the one end is making sweeping architectural changes. Uh, these are high risk because they're high impact. They affect a lot of the code. They affect the way the system works. Uh, generally, you want to do those a lot earlier in development, but that's also where you're generally going to get your biggest optimization gains. And all the way on the other end of the spectrum, making very targeted implementation changes, uh, you can usually do that much later in development, but it's much harder to get as big of gains through those. Uh, because the terrain system is a new system, uh, we were able to do things that kind of spanned all the way across this, uh, which was really nice. And so starting at the architectural level, uh, for the CPU side of the system, one of the biggest choices that we made uh, is doing on-demand processing through reactive APIs. And what this means is the terrain system itself and the underlying gradient system don't do anything. They just sit there. Uh, if nothing uses them, they don't consume any resources. It's only when you start adding systems like physics and rendering that query the system that things get processed. Uh, there's goods and bads to an architectural choice like this. Uh, the good side for us 
is that by designing it this way, instead of having to find optimizations that work holistically for very different types of systems, we're able to push the optimization problem down to the physics level, to the rendering level, and say, what's the right set of optimizations at each one of these levels to get to the goals that we want to get to? Uh, the downside of it is this is a terrain system. A lot of things need the same data. And so we are doing a lot of redundant work if some of these things need the exact same data at the same time. Uh, one of the biggest architectural changes we made from the rendering side uh, is we used to process the entire terrain uh, going into game and processing it dynamically. It's where our initial limits came from and it was completely not scalable. And so the biggest switch that we made was going to more of a camera relative system where it was processing from the camera's location outwards. Uh, and uh, what you see here, there's the terrain in the background and a picture of just a, a texture buffer from the terrain on top of it. Uh, because the thing that goes along with doing things from the camera outward is it's a fancy term called toroidal addressing. Really all it means is that instead of making the camera the center of your texture so that every time you move the camera a little bit, the entire texture needs to update one pixel at a time or five pixels at a time, uh, toroidal addressing lets you shift where the center point of your texture is. And so as you're updating through movements, you're just updating the lines of texture that needs to change and not the entire texture on every movement. So it's kind of a simple concept, fancy words, uh, but it's really at the heart of nearly everything we've built in the terrain system. Uh, going the next step down at kind of the more algorithmic level, um, we, like I said, we wanted the terrain to be dynamically modifiable, uh, but a lot of people also don't need that. And so we wanted to introduce the notion of baking or caching at very specific points in the system uh, to give people the ability to collapse a lot of this processing down. Uh, with the gradient system, uh, if you saw Johnny Galloway's talk yesterday, you can build out pretty complicated node graphs. And when you're calculating these things dynamically for millions or billions of points, uh, yeah, each node you're adding in that graph, that's another million or billion points that you're computing along the way. Uh, and so gradient baking is the ability to take this node graph and just collapse it down to a single image, uh, but the downside being that it's no longer changing dynamically. The good side is by doing this at the gradient level, you can actually feed that back into your graph and still introduce dynamic nodes on top of it if that's something you wanted to do. Uh, we had a similar concept on the PhysX side. This is another one that really benefits from being able to pre-compute a bunch of this stuff. And so again, we added the ability to do optional height field baking, but it also can still react to changes at runtime. On the graphics side, uh, we took caching in a slightly different direction. Instead of baking the data out, uh, we instead bake it at runtime using a system that's called clip maps. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with clip maps, clip maps are just, they're kind of like MIP maps, except for where MIP maps change uh, the size of your texture uh, to give you less and less resolution, and so they get smaller and smaller. Clip maps instead stay the same size, but cover twice as much distance with each one. And so what you see here with the concentric circles, uh, the top left corner, you can see the, gray, the blades of grass really easily. That's a very tiny circle. All the way out to that bottom right corner, it's covering a much larger distance in the world. Um, and so there's lower resolution uh, that you're seeing on the world at those points, uh, but the clip map has stayed the same size. And so this gives us another way of caching the information, uh, but uh, 
keeping it in a, a very controlled and scalable way instead of having to run it across the entire size of our world. Uh, now, clip maps, uh, they're not quite ready for prime time yet. They still have a couple of issues and they have trade-offs. Uh, and so what you see here uh, on the left without clip maps, this scene with doing some blending uh, per pixel with the blending happening every frame, it's running at 48 frames per second, uh, but using a little under a gig of VRAM. With clip maps turned on, we're using 700 megs more of VRAM, but we're running at full speed. Uh, so there's definitely a memory cost trade-off here, but it's another optional feature that can be used. And clip maps also start to pave the way for other features over time. Uh, if we wanted to introduce decals or other things that involve compositing even more onto the terrain. So the next piece that we wanted to address is just reducing the overall computations as we dynamically modify the terrain. And so on the CPU side of this, we did this just through better partitioning of regions. And so where we started, if you're making small modifications to the terrain, this pink box is showing how much of the terrain is updating on every little modification. And it's the entire terrain. Uh, and so the kind of conceptually simple idea is start passing around bound, bounding boxes instead of just a notification that things changed. And that way you can update, ah, try that again. You can update uh, just much smaller regions of your terrain and uh, eliminate a ton of computation and now dynamic changes scale with the size of your change instead of with the size of your world. And so that's one of the common themes here is, yeah, changing what our scaling factor is, that it's no longer the size of the world, and just doing less stuff. On the graphics side, uh, one of the ways we dealt with world sizes better uh, is through changing how we did LODs. So we used to do LODs where we divided the world into 64 meter sectors, and each one would scale down with different LODs how many polygons it had. And this is great, like as you get out into the distance, you're drawing less and less triangles, but your number of sectors is going up exponentially. And so instead, we now uh, scale the size of the sectors, but always leave them at 64 by 64. And so uh, as we zoom in, uh, what you'll see is the size of the squares are changing as we're getting closer to it. And uh, one of the other things I want to point out is just uh, to be able to use our LODs better, in a lot of systems, uh, as soon as you switch to a higher LOD, you generally have to break one big square into four little squares. And through some additional clever cleverness, uh, we were able to do that just one quarter at a time. And so we can be much more selective about when we're going to hire LODs and use continuous LOD blending to make it almost invisible. And so the, at the end of the day, from that change uh, in this scene with a one kilometer terrain, uh, looking out across the entire terrain, we went from drawing one and a half million vertices down uh, by 50% to three quarters of a million. Uh, we dropped our draw calls by 75%. Uh, I realize the two look different. That's actually due to many other bug fixes along the way. Uh, it's kind of hard to do before afters with a year of changes to a terrain system. Uh, so then, going down to the implementation level, um, this is where we really start getting a little more micro. The biggest thing that we needed to do CPU side is creating plural APIs. Um, because of the way the shape APIs and the gradient APIs had already been written, they had a single is point in shape, uh, get value, and so very singular. And if you need a million values, you're calling terrain get height, which calls gradient get value, which calls shape is in point a million times. Uh, 
uh, or a billion times. And the overhead of that, uh, it's wrecking your memory and instruction cache coherency, and you're inevitably doing a ton of redundant data because anything from mutex locks and unlocks to just calculations that really don't change across those million points, those can all get pulled out and done once instead of a million times just by creating a plural API that can process a million points at once at each layer instead of one at a time. Making this change made the APIs anywhere from 70 to 90% faster. On the graphics side, uh, one of the biggest micro-optimizations was for memory coherency was switching to Z-order buffers. And so uh, initially when we created our terrain patches, uh, we just kind of did the naive vertex approach on the left where you just run through and create your vertices one row at a time until you've created your entire patch. Looks nice and ordered, but for every triangle that you're drawing, one to two of uh, the three sets of vertices are always gonna be 64 uh, spots away in your buffers. And going to Z-ordering uh, drops that down significantly. And Z-ordering or Morton ordering, yeah, as you see, it makes these little Z patterns. And so it looks a little more chaotic in how you're creating your orders. You're making these little Zs that make recursively bigger and bigger Zs, uh, but you get significantly better coherency for each triangle. And this is what also allowed for that clever trick where we could eliminate entire quarters of an LOD almost trivially because each quarter is contiguous in the buffer, so we just can skip that entire range. So once you've done as much optimizing as you can, it's time to break out the smoke and mirrors. And for this, asynchronous processing comes into play when you've optimized all you can and you're trying to do something like this is that one kilometer terrain again and you're just trying to drag it around in the editor and you can see it's chunking. Uh, if I had made this bigger, it would look like the editor has locked up for several seconds at a time. And so we don't necessarily need it to process faster, but we need things more responsive. And so this is where we just need to get it off the main thread and make it asynchronous. It's still gonna run the same number of instructions and take the same amount of time, which is why I don't consider it a true optimization, but it's a huge improvement to the user experience. And so it can even be a little bit slower than running synchronously because you're adding a little bit of overhead at the start to spawn something, and you're adding a bit of overhead at the end to listen to things, uh, but the net result uh, this is a terrain that's four times the size. You can see where the updates are lagging, but it's remaining responsive, and it reaches a state of uh, what I would call eventual correctness, that as it settles in, everything gets back to where you want it to be. And so you can see what you're doing uh, without it impacting you as you're dragging things around. And the one place where you actually get true optimization benefits is when you do that synchronously, there's no concept of canceling because you don't even know another movement has happened until you've computed the entire thing. Uh, where with asynchronous, you can now have the concept of canceling the work you're doing. And so we don't have to run the entire set of work on every movement. We can keep canceling it and restarting it. And we're only processing from start to finish on that final one. And then finally, after you've gone asynchronous, kind of the obvious next step is to go parallel. And this is another one that I don't consider a true optimization because you're still using the same number of instructions and the same amount of CPU. You're just changing how effectively you're using the CPU. And so you can start to use more cores, more threads in parallel but you are robbing other systems from being able to use that same processing time. And so it's again a mixed bag. Uh, for us, for the terrain system, because we made it async, from an API perspective, it just means now adding in 
how many jobs do we want to run in parallel? Super easy, uh, except for this was probably one of the hardest technical things that we needed to deal with in O3DE because as it turns out, O3DE wasn't quite set up for this. And the big issue is that the terrain system is built on top of the gradient system, which is built on top of the shape system, and they all communicate through e-buses. Uh, e-buses are fantastic for communication, but they came with two uh, different policies for handling multi-threading. The first one, super safe, you put a mutex on your e-bus, and it will protect you from data coming in and out. So if you're querying a gradient or a terrain, and that's spawning or despawning during your query, um, the mutex will protect you from that. But it's also protecting every API call, so none of them are running in parallel. And so what you're seeing on the left here, uh, all of those light gray spots are where my threads are waiting on other threads to complete. And where it's dark, that's where it's actually doing the processing. Uh, so absolutely miserable for running things in parallel. The other option we had is to run things with what's called a lockless policy. And this means the eBus is using effectively no locks. Uh, and so it gives you uh, parallel API calls. And so you can see it's all dark, looks fantastic but it's not giving us any protection against things connecting and disconnecting to the bus. And so if we're querying the terrain and somebody's spawning some terrain out while we're doing that, we're going to crash. And so this is where we introduced a third policy to the eBus itself, uh, which is shared dispatch. And this gave us what we needed to be able to run our queries in parallel. Uh, it works similar to a shared mutex in that uh, we'll get nice, unique locking on those connects and disconnects. So we cannot run any parallel queries while those are happening. But for the entire rest of the time, which is most of the time, we can run all of our read-only queries in parallel. So that's kind of in a nutshell what we did. Uh, so let's take a look at where we got to. Uh, as a reminder, a year ago, uh, we had one square kilometer of terrain. And if I went up and hit that play button to go into game, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and we're finally flying around on our one by one kilometer terrain. And so at the end of the day, uh, yeah, we didn't know where we were going to get to with all these optimizations. I had no idea for this talk where we were going to get to. Uh, but our goal was 16 by 16 kilometers. Uh, this here is 64 by 64 kilometers, so over 4,000 square kilometers of terrain. It's the island of Maui at real world scale. And so if I go up and press that play button, one, two, and we're flying around this terrain. So I am amazed at what the team was able to accomplish. Um, <laughs> it turned out fantastic, way better than I was expecting. Uh, made writing this presentation a whole heck of a lot easier. <laughs> uh, but uh, as always, there are plenty of places that we could still continue to improve. Uh, these are just a few of them. For clip maps, they still need bug fixes before they're ready for usage. They need to be tuned. Uh, because of that giant memory cost, they would absolutely benefit from doing on-the-fly texture compression. Um, for PhysX, uh, updating height fields in that, uh, the biggest bottleneck at this point is the PhysX API itself, and so getting optimizations inside of that would be fantastic. Uh, for gradients, people consistently ask, hey, these things look like they're begging to be pushed to the GPU. Can we do that? I would love it. Um, it's not a trivial thing, um, especially because we need all that data back on the CPU. Uh, and so there's, there's a lot to that one, but I would love to see that happen someday. And then just taking that notion of dirty regions and expanding it through a lot more of our APIs. And then finally, I mentioned this at the start with the terrain. 
that, uh, yeah, we specifically made it reactive and on-demand, um, but it causes a lot of redundant processing, and so there's a lot of opportunity there to put in some optional caching even at that level, so that way we can reduce the amount of redundancies that are happening. And that's it. <laughs>